I want to bring in Dr. Jonathan Watanabe, a health policy expert and clinical pharmacy professor at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, thank you, doctor, for taking the time to be with us. I, I know you have a background in treatment. Um, this is a crisis that has impacted so many families in so many different ways. Uh, but when we talk about Purdue Pharma, in this case that's playing out, and OxyContin in particular, in your experience, how often are the stories of people who you have treated, um, families that have been impacted, uh, is directly connected to that particular drug? You know, I wouldn't be able to speculate specifically on OxyContin's representation in the, the number of opioid use-related deaths. We do know that, that it's still not crested yet in terms of the total number of, of opioid-related deaths, the number of overdose deaths, it has exceeded 107,000 uh, people in the last year for the first time. We know that most of that is is explained by opioids, and the most of that is actually explained by fentanyl. We certainly know that at the uh, initiation of this, which we have not yet kind of reached the end to, that OxyContin certainly played a role in that. Um, but now we know that uh, certainly the the horrendous genie is out of the bottle in, in terms of uh, access to opioids. Uh, in the communities and we're doing everything we can in terms of some very recent important policy activities to try to improve the treatment for individuals that are suffering for opioid use disorder. We know that every five minutes in the United States uh, somebody uh, dies due to, due to an overdose, uh, but there's been some very important steps that have recently been, been in, taking place in the United States. We've got um, over-the-counter naloxone that's now been approved. We know that there's been some changes in terms of getting access to buprenorphine, so these, these treatments that uh, historically were a little bit more difficult for prescribers to prescribe. Those, um, those regulatory hurdles have been dropped, so now there's an increase in terms of the access to opioid use disorder treatments. Uh, there's a lot of important headway, but we know that um, uh, overdoses, they, they now they account for more deaths in the United States than car accidents or gun-related deaths. And so this is really something that we have to find new avenues to try to, to contain. Um, and we're doing many of those, but, but a lot of that relates to trying to improve the awareness, the uh, regulations in terms of prescribing sure. that don't make a lot of sense, as well as getting improved access to treatments. Is there within the for, community? Absolutely, and, and I think for for those who are are in this struggle, and for so many people, it's a struggle that that unfortunately can never end. But are you optimistic that some of the policies you're talking about, some of the treatment that you see firsthand in your work, can actually help more people recover, or is the opioid crisis something we will be dealing with forever? I think that there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic with just the, the, the discussions we've, we've mentioned. I think that just in the recent past, in terms of the uh, national exposure, as well as some real policy changes that are going to make a difference, over-the-counter naloxone being available, not just uh, behind the counter in pharmacies, but available in um, retailing centers, in they've got it in potentially in kiosks being able to make it available at schools and community centers not only does that improve the availability of life-saving uh technology life-saving medications but also that just tells you that we're starting to reframe in terms of how we think about this that it really is a chronic brain disorder that like many other disorders we find mechanisms of treating it and finding ways to access that reduce that level of stigma that we often hear about so I think there, there really is a, a frame shift in terms of what we are, what we are practicing and what we are in, in many ways funding to try to make a difference. So that includes the, the harm reduction technologies that we've mentioned with, with uh, over-the-counter nar Narcan and Naloxone, but also trying to improve treatment. I mentioned buprenorphine. We're discussing trying to find ways to get better access to um, other established treatments like um, uh, methadone for, for using for opioid use disorder treatment. Sure. So I think that there is really some, some innovative approaches, all, many of them involving pharmacies that are community-based. So trying to find ways to get right. patients to get um, more simplistic access. Well, and I, th I, th I wanna, cause I know you've worked in this field for such a long time. Do you remember when the opioid crisis started? Like, was there a moment for you? Like as today, we're talking about the Sackler family, they've gotten a lot of attention. Do you remember when you realized that this was beginning and then spiraling to the place that we are today? 
Uh, you know, I was in training when it was probably slightly preceded that, where there was still that notion of, of um, we've got to find every possible mechanism or means of, of treating pain. And I think that that, that notion, it, it just got out of hand in terms of fitting with the data. So making sure that the evidence always aligns that we're doing that important longitudinal assessment to make sure that we're a, a, appropriately treating pain and we're not putting ourselves in harm's way where we're increasing the chance that um, uh, addiction could strike. I think that that was, that was part of the, of the narrative was just trying to ensure that we contained uh, pain and pain management, but that the, the compass sort of uh, was altered in terms of ensuring that we're treating it effectively. And that also at the same time, and I think there are some important strides now being taken on this. Sure. That whenever we talk about pain management, we also talk about assuring that there's going to be access to addiction treatment as well. And, and that looking is so at important. when we start a medication, Absolutely. we should also st talk about when we can discontinue it. It's, it's such an important point. Dr. Jonathan Watanabe, professor uh, of clinical pharmacy and health policy at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Such an important story. I appreciate your time. Now, this is a story that we are.